Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the past week. Of course, we had big AMD news from the AMD press event already covered on the channel, but there's also some other things to talk about, like Microsoft rediscovering the page file and using it as a giant marketing phrase for the Xbox, AMD and X570 and why it costs what it does. The motherboards do appear to be higher in price, and we'll explain why here. And then also NVIDIA Super, uh, USB 4.0 arriving in 2020, and Comcast, to absolutely nobody's surprise, violating the Consumer Protection Act over 445,000 times. Before that, this video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare makes it easy to learn skills and advance yourself professionally with classes available for just about everything. We found the JavaScript Toolkit class taught by Christiane Heilman, a senior developer at Microsoft, to be of notable interest for our audience. The class is an intro on how to get started with JavaScript and covers skills you need to be marketable for web development. Skillshare costs $10 per month on an annual subscription, or click the link in the description below for a two-month free trial of Skillshare Premium. Quick GN note, the large mod mats are back up for back order on the store. We put a hold on ordering due to the tariffs. We figured it all out, didn't have to raise the prices. And if you want to back order the next round, it's on store.gamersnexus.net. The medium ones, like in front of me, are in stock already, so you can go to the store for that. Uh, why does AMD X570 cost so much? We've gotten this question a lot over the last, well, since Computex. And there's a few things to keep in mind here. So, uh, number one, AMD is now starting to get some of the higher end brands associated with the motherboard manufacturers. So this is an instance where the price isn't actually going up, it's just that AMD is getting some higher end boards. Now there are places where the price is going up, but when you see the $700 Extreme or you see the $777 Godlike, both prices we've already talked about, although originally we thought the Extreme would be 600, it's actually it's going to be higher than that probably. But when we saw those, uh, those boards, there's a lot of sticker shock associated with that. Keep in mind that the Intel platforms, which have historically been, uh, they, they've had more development focus over the years, put it that way. Uh, the Intel platforms have had boards like this for ages. You look at some of the super high-end Asus Gigabyte motherboards. Uh, MSI has had a godlike over there for a little bit. So it, this is not new to motherboards. It's just that it's new to AMD Ryzen. So AMD is finally getting, it's being taken a bit more seriously by the motherboard makers where they are willing to associate their super high-end brands, whether or not it's worth that price point. Uh, it depends on what you're doing with it, but they're willing to associate their high-end brands with AMD now. And that's part one. It's as simple as they're more expensive boards because they're higher-end boards this time. You get things like a true 14-phase VRM, all of which use 70-amp power stages, for example. So that, that starts to add the price. Uh, next thing, the chipset costs more. Our understanding is that the chipset costs about two times more than the previous, the X370 or X470 chipset, which was more or less the same thing. It was more, it, it was primarily a, a demarcation in the differences in motherboard generations more than an actual chipset difference. The difference between 370 and 470 was better memory support because of the motherboard BIOS, not because of the chipset. But the chipset came with it. It was part of the refresh. So 370 and 470, basically the same thing. It's just that, well, it is the same thing. It's just that it costs about two times more to move to 570. It's a higher power consuming chip. AMD is repurposing Ryzen IO die silicon for that chip and uh, is not using as media to the extent they were previously where it was externally designed. So that's part of it as well. The chipset cost goes up. Now two times higher, uh, it, is, it's still not a super expensive part. You're talking like maybe in the 30 to $40 range for X570 as opposed to half of that for 470. Uh, but that's still a cost that you'll pay for. PCIe Gen 4 rerouting uh, required for some of the motherboard designs. So the motherboard manufacturers couldn't just take their previous generation and then pop a new chipset in it and sell it. It did require some additional trace work, rerouting. Uh, a lot of them redesigned the VRMs while they were at it. So being unable to repurpose an old design does increase the cost because they're spending R&D or engineering time on designing the new ones, and that drives up the cost. PCIe Gen 4 signal integrity is a challenge. So some of these boards have, and we don't know how necessary this is because we don't, we don't do signal integrity uh, parametric analysis or anything like that. But some of the boards, like the MSI Godlike, have moved to a higher quality PCB material. And whether or not that's necessary, again, 
we're not really in the position to validate. That's something that we'll leave to EE Times or someone like that. But uh, that does have a cost associated with it as well. So if it's actually needed to move to a higher quality PCB material, it's definitely needed to reroute some of the traces, then uh, Gen 4 does add to cost and signal integrity becomes a challenge that it contributes to the price we're seeing for the boards that do cost more than you would expect. There are still boards in the 140-ish to 190 range, not quite as many uh, as we'd like to see yet, but not all the boards have had their prices disclosed at this time. Other boards are more expensive than their previous X470 counterparts, but um, overall, a lot of the, the sticker shock is coming from the fact that higher-end boards are finally associated with Ryzen. So that's part, part one of this. Part two of this comes from MSI's CEO, Charles Chan, who we report on something he said to Tom's Hardware last week as well. But in further discussion with Tom's Hardware, he stated, quote, lots of people ask me, what do you think about today's AMD? I say today's AMD is a completely different company compared to two, three, five years ago. They have nice technology and they are there to put the higher spec with the reasonable pricing. But right now they say, hey Charles, let's push to marketing to the higher end. So let's sell higher pricing motherboards, higher spec motherboards, and let's see what will happen in the market. So I don't think that AMD is the company that wants to sell low cost here and low cost there. And uh, I guess given that MSI CEO is, is never one to mince words, it does look like AMD has some potential hand in, in wanting those higher end boards. And now that uh, the AMD sales are doing so well in DIY, as we've seen upwards of 80% month to month, uh, some of the market share change from Intel to, to AMD, it looks like AMD is starting to feel confident in the product it has and wants the higher end boards associated with it. So anyway, uh, everyone's looking for healthier margins here with X570 and with the new Ryzen 3000 series CPUs. There's one final quote from AMD's Don Wallagroski who said the following, if someone's searching for a platform and doesn't really need that enthusiast class PCIe Gen 4 storage, or you're not planning to buy a PCIe Gen 4 graphics card in the next six months to a year, it makes a lot of sense to look at those lower tier motherboards like the X470 or B450, which will offer the same performance on those Ryzen third gen processors as the X570 will, which is, again, just a reminder, if you have X470, in theory, you should be able to just pop the new processor into it once it gets a, a firmware update to detect it, and Gigabyte's already pushed those out. Others uh, probably coming soon. It's just that you won't have PCIe Gen 4. But if you don't need that, and almost everybody watching this will not need it, then you can use X470. Uh, finally, quick note here. So B550, or whatever it's going to be called, uh, we were told at CES that this was to be expected in first half of 2020. That was, it's, that was in January, we were told that, first half of 2020. It looks like that's remained more or less true. Uh, we saw a couple reports today at time of filming that went up and said first quarter of 2020 uh, or first half. So that remains true. If you do want the lower end boards, those will be coming out next year. USB 4.0 arriving in 2020. Apparently, the USB group has decided that people need to be uh, increasingly confused by USB naming, and so 4.0 is coming out, including a difference in where the space is positioned, or if there is one, between USB and the number marking the USB version. Anatech was able to catch up with USB Promoter Group at Computex 2019 and revealed to Anatech that the newest specification is on its way to be delivered in late 2020. USB 4.0 currently exists in version 0.7, with the final revision expected this summer. The USB Promoter Group believes USB 4.0 will be widely available in products by end of 2020. USB 4.0 leans heavily into Thunderbolt 3 technology, and while the new standard is expected to offer 40 gigabits per second bandwidth, USB 4 is also allegedly going to be more substantial than just that. Supposedly, USB 4 will be significant enough to warrant a new logo and a new branding scheme, again, USB 4 will also use a Type-C interface and be backwards compatible with USB 3.2, USB 2.0, and Thunderbolt 3. If you recall, the USB IF announced a confusing new USB 3.2 standard not so long ago, and hopefully any revised branding will be simpler, and we won't end up with USB 4.0 Gen negative 1 to mark uh, USB 3.0 or something like that, because that's kind of what happened this time. Xbox Project Scarlet, Microsoft. Uh, and, its, and its marketing team have rediscovered uh, virtual memory and the page file. 
and they're really excited about it. At E3 2019, Microsoft finally disclosed a few key details on its upcoming consoles. We already knew that Zen 2 would be used. We knew that Navi parts would be used. This is true for the Sony PlayStation as well, which, by the way, had no announcement at E3 this year. Uh, rumors have long suggested that Microsoft will roll out at least two consoles, similar in vain to the current Xbox uh, One X and the One S. There's also talk of a console aimed exclusively at streaming, and that would complement Microsoft's upcoming X Cloud. The unveiled console is currently known as Project Scarlet, and much like the next PlayStation console, it will feature some interesting hardware. As expected, Microsoft is using a semi-custom solution from AMD based on Zen 2. No word on core count, but it's presumably an 8-core part like Sony's. AMD's RDNA architecture that is currently powering Navi will also be present in some form. Microsoft is using GDDR6 memory and is using solid-state storage. Microsoft also stated that the SSD will double as virtual RAM. 1962 called, and it wants its page file back. So virtual RAM uh, is not new and is in fact very, very old. But because I, this just, it gives you an idea of, in the very least, who Microsoft thinks the crowd is watching their E3 presentations. And uh, at worst, gives you a look at who the crowd is watching the E3 presentations. Um, because apparently virtual RAM was enough of a marketing buzzword to get people excited or something. But anyway. There's also supposed to be hardware level support for ray tracing. A couple of things here we've talked about in the past. Uh, unlike Sony, Microsoft did not make any mention of audio or potentially ray traced audio, which is a thing, by the way. But it did talk about hardware accelerated ray tracing. And hardware accelerated ray tracing is something you've been able to do for a very long time. It's just that doing it in real time, that's the new part. That's the hard part. We talked about this with Gordon in one of our videos uh, where I mentioned that NVIDIA has sort of retroactively invented ray tracing. And to be extremely clear this time, no, we don't think NVIDIA invented ray tracing, obviously. But the marketing around RTX was so strong that they've more or less rewritten the history, whether intentional or by, or by accident, uh, to the extent that NVIDIA is getting a lot of credit for ray tracing has completely shifted the discussion of graphics to ray tracing, which huge, massive credit to NVIDIA's marketing for being able to do that, something that has been otherwise exciting primarily to CG students or to movie makers, maybe some game developers. But uh, anyway, accelerated ray tracing by hardware doesn't mean a whole lot. We need to see what it's actually doing. Hardware accelerated ray tracing could be stuff you've been able to do forever, which is render scenes frame by frame over a very long period of time in Blender. Or it could be something like some really simplified version of tracing a, a couple rays for a mirror or something like that in a game. Uh, we'll see. We don't expect it to be obviously anywhere as powerful as something like a 2080 Ti, which is half the size of an entire Xbox on its own. But uh, we'll, we'll see what it does. Microsoft also touted 8K gaming and noted that Project Scarlet will be able to deliver 120 FPS, not at the same time, to be very clear at that. Uh, so that's mostly marketing hyperbole right now. But what's more likely is that support for 8K resolutions is potentially by way of upscaling, or maybe, again, through this xCloud service. And uh, the 120 hertz refresh rates are probably going to be at, well, definitely going to be at lower resolutions. Uh, sort of a rumor here, but not really. NVIDIA Super GPUs and what they're getting, what they'll be. NVIDIA teased Super at Computex 2019. And uh, it was pretty interesting, actually, because it was just ahead of the AMD keynote. So it was almost one of those NVIDIA, like, let's test the waters and see what AMD is doing. Maybe play a little bit of head games with people. And if AMD makes a major announcement at Computex, then we'll announce what Super actually is. That didn't happen yet. But we've been uh, more or less telling you what it's going to be for a while now. And it looks like everybody else is starting to report the same stuff. So. Super is supposed to be, functionally, a TI refresh. And uh, it looks like there's going to be a 2070, a 2060, and a 2080 that might get some additional uh, RT, Tensor, and CUDA cores. So it, it is, I mean, these, these things all exist within the SMs for the most part. So 
Pro it's, it's a TI refresh is what it is. It's just being called Super this time. Uh, there's some conflicting theories on just how many cores the new touring cards will receive, so we won't speculate just yet. There are a lot of different numbers out there. We're not going to quote any of them because we don't know which are accurate. But NVIDIA is allegedly planning to achieve this via refined Turing silicon, or in some cases, the cards receiving a cut-down version of the Turing die from the card directly above it. For example, the Super RTX 2060 is supposedly being retrofitted with a new version of the TU-106 die found in the RTX 2070. The Super RTX 2070 will move to a, allegedly move to a chopped down TU-104 die. The Super RTX 2080 will receive a beefier TU-104 die, allegedly, and there's speculation of a cutback TU-102 die. So we've talked about the plans for increased core counts, or well, we've talked about a TI refresh before, which is what we meant by that. Uh, we've also talked about increased memory speeds, but the more, the, the firmer speculation out there is now saying the RTX 2070, sorry, 2080 Super will be outfitted with 8 gigabytes of 16 gigabit per second GDDR6, which is a move over the 14 gigabit per second previous uh, version. That's gigabits, not gigabytes. So more importantly, the Super RTX 2060, or whatever it's called, should see a bump in memory according to the new rumors. This is not one we've heard independently, but uh, to 8 gigabytes of G6 from 6, and memory speeds for that one will remain at 14 gigabits per second, with the same being allegedly true for the RTX 2070. So uh, the talk here is that basically this is N NVIDIA's play at reducing the existing device prices and then putting in a new tier where those were or slightly above it, which will allow NVIDIA to more directly challenge AMD with its Navi RX 5700 XT and 5700 non-XT cards that are coming out. Comcast, everyone's best friend, violating the Consumer Protection Act 445,000 times and counting. Can't be off by a thousand. That would that would make it seem like it didn't matter. That same state of Washington also found that Comcast violated the Consumer Protection Act the hundreds of thousands of times we've stated. Comcast was caught non-consensually signing up customers for a worthless, in quotes, service protection plan. On top of enrolling customers into the plan, some of whom actively declined it, Comcast was also misrepresenting the cost of the plan. Comcast was charging almost 31,000 customers for this plan, and it misrepresented or misinformed 18,600 customers. All in all, Comcast raked in about $85 million from its duplicitous behavior between 2011 and 2016. On top of the $9.1 million fine, which in contrast to the $85 million it made does seem quite small, Comcast will also pay an undisclosed amount of restitution to affected customers, with 12% interest on top. Washington outlines Comcast's violations of the Consumer Protection Act as such. Quote, 240,588 violations for signing up SPP customers without their consent, and 205,260 violations for failing to disclose or misrepresenting the recurring cost of the SPP. So uh, ISP is once again proving to everyone that they deserve our money. Huawei's woes continue. Tokyo Electron and WD are backing away from Huawei, which uh, has been struggling with the US trade blacklist over the last month or two. Despite trying to save face, Huawei's troubles continue to mount after finding itself on the US trade blacklist. Huawei recently had to put a hold on its development and manufacturing of laptops, and smartphones may be next. Reuters reported that Western Digital, who has supplied Huawei with hard drives and flash memory, has suspended its business with the company following the blacklisting. Western Digital CEO Steve Milligan expressed concern regarding the tension between the American and Chinese economies. Quote, the tech supply chain in the world is quite entangled, Milligan said, and went on to highlight that untangling the tech supply chain would not be good for the U.S. or China, uh, in his opinion. Also dropping Huawei is Tokyo Electron, the third largest supplier of semiconductor manufacturing equipment. Reuters reports that at least one more major Japanese semiconductor equipment supplier is considering ceasing any potential business with Huawei. While Tokyo Electron isn't a U.S.-based company, it is one that imports and uses U.S. goods and intellectual property, which means it needs to protect its relations with the U.S., much like ARM. LG outs one millisecond displays at E3 2019, as reported by Overclock 3D. 
During E3 2019, LG announced the LG Ultra Gear Nano IPS lineup, which appears to be the first IPS set of displays with a one millisecond response time, a luxury previously only afforded to other panels. On top of the superior color accuracy and production the IPS panels claim to bring, they also sport 144 Hz refresh rates. The lineup is currently comprised of two models, the 38GL950G, 38 inches, and the 27GL850, 27 inches. The 38-inch model sports a curved screen with a 3840 by 1600 resolution, while the 27-inch model is curveless with a resolution of 2560 by 1440. Both use nano IPS technology and are G-Sync compatible, which, uh, as a reminder, G-Sync compatible, that phrasing means basically FreeSync. Uh, it's, it's different from G-Sync, the module. And then LG and its Ultra Gear Nano IPS models will be available for pre-order July 1st. Of course, we'd recommend reading reviews from other people because we don't review monitors before pre-ordering those. Pricing is to be announced on them. And then finally, are you ready to pwn noobs with Razer's new respawn drink? Or if you're a fan of pure ownage, you know it's pronounced own. It's if you watched the show 15 years ago, you'll get it. Razer is now offering Lethargic Gamers a new um, mental performance drink. Yikes. It would seem Razer Respawn is another April Fool's joke that made it manifest. If anyone remembers Project Venom, that was the name of it circa 2010. So if you've ever felt the need to put venom in your body, then not an energy drink, but a mental performance drink is... It's the right bet for you. I don't want anything more than respawn as a drink because that implies that it's probably going to kill me. Uh, the drink comes in a powder form, like I guess Gatorade powder or something, and Razor is adamant that respawn is not an energy drink despite the 95 milligrams of caffeine. Respawn is available in four different flavors. It comes in a pack of 20 for $25. Separately, there is a $30 Respawn branded tumbler available for purchase. No Chroma RGB at this point, unfortunately, although we hope to see support in the future. And if you're not a gamer, no problem. Razer also insists that Respawn is for sleepy content creators, the biggest buzzword of 2019, or anyone who sits at a computer. So everybody, not limiting the market there. Uh, anyway, we don't... We just thought it was kind of funny. Hopefully this doesn't cause people to go buy it. So um, that's the Venom, uh, that's the Respawn drink that Razer's doing. Thank you for watching. Hopefully you got some useful news items here. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help us directly or patreon.com slash gamersnexus. We'll see you all next time.